I was going to say a very warm welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I've, I've been slightly preoccupied with the fact that we may all be blown away any moment. As, as you can see, I've brought the weather specially for you from London. Um, anyway, it is a very, very great pleasure for me to be here tonight. Um, I've given some talks in some nice places before, but I think the grounds of Topkapi Palace and this extraordinary ancient uh, great building in which the concert is taking place is probably the most astonishing setting I could ever have imagined. Um, now tonight's program is rather eclectic. Uh, the Moscow soloists have chosen works ranging from the lavish Baroque world of Telemann right through to a piece by the Chinese composer Tan Dun, which was written as recently as the year 2000, I believe for his film Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. Um, but the evening also showcases the talent of one of the most extraordinary young pianists I've ever been lucky enough to hear, Daniel Trifonov from Russia. Um, last year, I interviewed him in London and heard him play there the other Chopin concerto, the number two in F minor. It was a very extraordinary performance, full of insights and poetry and magic. And as I'm a former pianist myself, um, Chopin is something very, very close to my heart. And therefore, tonight, I wanted to home in on that concerto, which was written when Chopin was all of 20 years old. And I thought what we could do is to explore some of the factors that fed into the young Chopin style, the things that made him the artist he was at that stage of his life, and that then carried on developing after that and made him into the, the great, great piano composer and performer that he went on to be before his very, very untimely death of tuberculosis. Um, the concerto, though it's called number one, the one we're hearing tonight, was actually the second to be written. Um, the F minor concerto was written first. It was such a success when Chopin premiered it in Warsaw that he set about writing another one straight away. I think he may have had a certain commercial noose as a young man. And it was, of course, the first one that was published, this one. Um, so what are these qualities that stand out in this extraordinary piece of music, the things that um, contribute to its unique magic? Um, I would like to break it down into a few special components. Um, firstly, there's Chopin's passion for his homeland, which was, of course, Poland. Then there's the overarching musical impact upon him of Bach and Mozart. His love for bel canto opera, the music of, of the Italian bel canto composers like Bellini, Donizetti, and Rossini and generally, indeed, the sound of the human voice. And last, but by no means least, there's his own flair as a pianist, and particularly his special bent for improvisation. So Chopin was born in the Polish countryside in 1810, on a country estate that uh, belonged to a family called the Skarbeks, who are employing Chopin's father, Nicolas, who was French, as a tutor to their children. Chopin was the second of four siblings. He was the only boy. And then the family moved to Warsaw before he was even a year old. From the start, he was a sensitive, rather sickly child. And in fact, he may have been a teenager at the time he contracted what would eventually become his fatal tuberculosis. But there was no doubting his musical talent when he created his very first piece of music at the age of seven. Um, I say created because he didn't yet know how to write it down, and his father had to do it for him. Um, it was a polonaise. Uh, it's often pointed out that Chopin's first work was a polonaise, and his last was a mazurka. It's as if these Polish national dances held a very, very special place in his heart. And they were, of course, forms that he returned to time and again throughout his musical life. In Warsaw, Chopin studied composition at the conservatoire under its director, Joseph Elsner, and he quickly began to build a very strong reputation with some early works for piano and orchestra, um, one-off movements that were shorter than concertos, but certainly showed off what he could do both as performer 
and as composer. But shortly after the premiere of this concerto in E minor, a Polish uprising took place against the country's subservience to Russian rule. Now Chopin and his best friend, Titus Wojciechowski, had departed on a trip to Vienna um, just a few weeks before the uprising took place. Um, they'd been intending to travel on to Italy, but Titus immediately announced he was going to go home and fight. He was going to join the revolutionaries. Now, the issue of why Chopin didn't go with him is somewhat debated, I would say, but it seems likely that being, um, I believe he weighed all of seven stone. He was slight, he was sickly, he wasn't up to fighting, however much he wanted to do so. And I think that is probably why he stayed where he was and didn't go back. But also, his revolutionary sympathies could have been extremely dangerous after the revolution was put down by the Russians in a very horrible way, not long afterwards. The upshot was that Chopin never went back to his beloved Poland. He settled in Paris, where his French name must have d done a certain amount to help him settle in, though he did often say he would have liked to be called Chopinsky. The pain of exile after that fed into Chopin's Polish style and amplified their emotional intensity. I think increasingly so as time went by. We could think of the powerful late pieces such as the Polonaise Fantasy or the Mazurkas, Opus 53 and 56. These are highly sophisticated musical poems that go miles beyond any notion of, oh, a, a dance transferred to a salon. These are deeply philosophical, rather visionary pieces. But the thing is that that's not where Chopin's love for his homeland began. That goes right back to the beginning. And the E minor concerto's first movement, um, indeed, has more than a little in common with the Polonaise. It's even marked Maestoso, which is a, an instruction that Chopin gives for a lot of his Polonaises. As a dance, the Polonaise is quite a formal event. Um, it's a formal kind of procession that's traditionally used to open a ball. I discovered this in a rather hands-on way last Christmas. I went to a ball that was put on in London by the Chopin Society, and guess how it began? So I was lucky enough to be sitting next to a gentleman from Vienna who had grown up dancing in Vienna's great ballrooms, and he showed me exactly how to do the Polonaise. Um, basically, all the couples present at the ball line up and process around the room in set patterns. You go around the outside and then you sort of wind into the center. And the idea of it is that everyone can see who is there without having to look around and sort of peer over people's shoulders in a very rude manner. Um, it's a strong, stately kind of dance. If it was in duple meter, it would indeed be a march. Um, the concerto's first movement is really quite modeled upon this, although sometimes it's cross rhythms and the way it drifts into more reflective realms um, do suggest that it's only a starting point for a considerable flight of fantasy. I'd just like to play you a bit of one of Chopin's Polonaises so you can hear the similarity to the concerto. This is the Polonaise in F sharp minor. I hope it is. Can everyone hear okay? So that was the Polonaise, and now this is the beginning of the concerto.
about recording is, of course, on the, s on the side that emphasizes stately as opposed to dance in the idea of a stately dance. It'd be interesting to see what the performance tonight does in that respect. An altogether more sprightly dance forms the basis of the finale of the concerto. It's a Polish dance that Chopin only actually wrote a handful of times in his entire output. It's called the Krakowiak, and of course it comes from the Krakow area of southern Poland. Um, it's a fast duple meter dance, and it's said, I believe, to be inspired by, by the movements of horses. So I'd like to play you a real Polish Krakowiak played by a folk band. So again, you can see where it's going to come from. there's an earworm in this entire playlist, I'm afraid it could turn out to be that one. I've been walking around Istanbul humming it all day. Um, here is the way that the final movement of the concerto begins. So this is actually quite unusual around the year 1830, a piano concerto that relates that strongly to the composer's national folk music. It's something you would associate much more with composers like Dvorak, for example, in the, in the Czech area, and much, much later in the 19th century. Chopin was quite a pioneer in this respect. But this wasn't the only way that this concerto stood out from the crowd. I remember hearing a recorded reconstruction once of a concert program from Chopin's day, putting his early pieces for piano and orchestra before even the concertos into context with some of the music that would have been played on either side of it at the time. Now, of course, at any point in history, a lot more bad music is written than good. It's just one of those sad inevitabilities. And, of course, 1830 was no exception to that. Most of the other music on that recording was, I'm afraid, eminently forgettable. It was some re-churned ideas from the cusp of classicism and romanticism, lacking in that kind of distinctive voice that makes you sit up and think, here is someone who has something to say that I want to hear. By contrast, Chopin's qualities came bowling out at 100 miles an hour. There would be no mistaking that this young man was an absolute genius. But that's not to say that he had no influence from the past. He does very much so. And indeed, they were the very best influences that any composer could have, Bach and Mozart. You can hear the legacy of Mozart, for example, in the kind of balance and poise of Chopin's writing. You'll have had some idea of it, I think, from what we've just been listening to. Um, so it's the way he shapes the phrases as well as the actual form of the concertos. Like most of Mozart's piano concertos, the E minor concerto has that processional opening movement, a tender aria-like andante and a lively finale. But it's, it's interesting that not that many of Mozart's opening movements are in triple time. Um, I can only think of two or three that are. What Mozart does do very frequently, though, is to use his woodwind instruments as soloists, especially in the slow movements. 
he creates a kind of concertante group in which the piano and the wind instruments become a, a group that play together almost as in relief from the rest of the orchestra. The woodwind instruments become almost equal with the piano. And I think Chopin's been taking this as a bit of a model. Um, here in the E minor concerto slow movement, the piano sings a kind of duet with a rather unlikely instrument. It's actually the bassoon. I'm going to try and get exactly the right spot to demonstrate this. I think if Mozart had written that, I think he'd been quite proud of it. Now, Chopin's orchestration comes in for quite a lot of criticism. And I, for one, think that it, that is patently unfair. Um, the thing is that his orchestration differs very, very considerably from Beethoven's. And Beethoven became the kind of gold standard in orchestration for the early 19th century. This probably accounts for the fact that some people just say, oh, well, Chopin's orchestration is not very good. Um, the thing is, there are other ways to look at this. It's always easy to regard something as empirically wrong for not doing something that, in fact, it was never trying to do in the first place. Now, any string player from the orchestra, and my husband is an orchestral string player, um, will probably say that this piece is boring to play. And yeah, from their point of view, it probably is. But what Chopin is doing for his soloist and for his audience is surrounding the solo piano line with a sort of sonic halo that's formed by long sustained string lines. And if there is a comparison to make here, it's actually with Bach and the St. Matthew Passion. In the St. Matthew Passion, Bach surrounds the recitives for Christus with sustained strings, which give his words a sort of, as I said, a sonic halo. Um, distinguishing him from the company around him. Um, Chopin may not have got that effect directly from Bach um, because it was only the year before this concerto was written that the St. Matthew Passion was resuscitated for the 19th century by the young Mendelssohn in Leipzig. He dug it out and gave the world premiere when he, conducting it when he was all of 19 or 20 himself. Now, we can't be sure whether or not Chopin actually got wind of this or would have seen the score. Um, but he certainly had an affinity with Bach that is quite extensive. And he may even have had some sort of intuitive inclination because of his passion for Bach to thinking along those same lines of creativity. Um, Chopin's writing for the piano is extremely contrapuntal as Bach's was. Um, numerous different voices are always woven together in the way that he writes. If, if you were listening to that last example, you've heard him writing in almost as a duet in the piano's right hand in thirds and sixths. Um, there's also a very strong harmonic structure that underpins his music, just as it does Bach, so that the musical logic and progression is there and can be recognized even when there's no obvious melody over the top. Um, I'd, again, I'd just like to play you a bit of Bach and a bit of Chopin that I think will show you this affinity in a very strong way. The first is a prelude by Bach, the very first prelude in C major from the Well-Tempered Clavier, which I'm sure many of you will recognize. And the second is the first of Chopin's 24 preludes, which were, again, modeled after Bach. And this, I hope, will show you how direct that comparison is. So here comes the Bach.
now this is the Chopin. So as you can hear, it's all about the harmony. There's a little more melody in the Chopin, but not that much. It's, th it's that harmonic structure that gives the thing its impetus and its meaning. And that's how close Chopin could get to Bach's writing. At the piano, he would sometimes tell his pupils, practice Bach constantly. This will be your best means to make progress. And actually, this is advice given by piano teachers to this day. One pupil of Chopin's, Friederike Streicher, recalled Chopin one morning playing through 14 Bach preludes and fugues for her from memory, and then simply saying, these one should never forget. Another pupil, um, one Carol Mikuli, says of Chopin, above all, he prized Bach, and between Bach and Mozart, it is hard to say whom he loved more. His interpretation of their music was of unrivaled greatness. Back in 1830, though, there was another person whom the young Chopin possibly did love more than Bach and Chopin. She was a young singer named Konstantia Gladowska. She was a fellow student at the Warsaw Conservatory, and she sang frequently op at the Opera House in Warsaw. Chopin was transfixed by her and would go time after time to the opera to hear her sing. If you read his letters, especially his later letters, actually, after he moved to Paris, it's interesting to see that Chopin was actually what today we would term either an opera buff, to be kind, or a canary fancier, to be unkind. Um, he adored opera, Italian bel canto in particular. And when he moved to Paris, he wrote a lot of letters about his repeat visits to the opera house, noting how many times he's been to hear a particular work, dissecting the singers and their techniques quite minutely, and comparing them to one another. Uh, but in Warsaw, for the time being, he had a desperate crush on Constantia, if from a reasonably safe distance. And Constantia sang during the very concert in which the E minor concerto was premiered. Chopin described the occasion like this in a letter. Dressed becomingly in white with roses in her hair, she sang the cavatina from Rossini's La Donna del Lago as she has never sung anything except for the aria in Pears Agnese. You know that, o quante lagrime per te Versailles, she uttered tutto desto to the bottom B, in such a way that my friend Zielinski held that single B to be worth a thousand ducats. This is typical canary fancier stuff. But she must have been quite, quite an impressive talent, I think. That autumn concert was given seven weeks before the outbreak of the Polish national uprising and three weeks before Chopin left Warsaw forever. It was in fact dubbed his farewell concert. He wrote, the trunk for the journey is bought, scores corrected, handkerchiefs hemmed, nothing left but to bid farewell and most sadly. In his trunk, he carried an, uh, an autograph album in which Constantia had written the words while others may better appraise and reward you, they certainly can't love you any better than we do. Some two years later, Chopin simply added the words, they can. That was in Paris after his first public appearance at the Salle Pleyel. Now, I've got here a recording of that Rossini Cavatina that Constantia sang that night. This is Italian bel canto, uh, pretty much as bel canto as it ever gets. Listen out for the virtuoso decorative lines, the so-called fioritura, the rapid decorations that always have to sound exquisitely delicate and very, very precise. And from this recording, you can probably guess how difficult it is to do. Um, Chopin's music for the piano is chock full of this kind of thing, um, but transferred to the piano made pianistic and extended for the piano's capabilities in a way that a singer's voice would simply never be able to do. I'll 
um, indicate that tutto desto that so impressed our young Chopin. So I think Constantia must have been pretty good. Um, it was from this bel canto style that Chopin drew those fioriture and also his love for writing melodies in thirds and sixths, something that you find constantly in Bellini and Donizetti, for example. These were stylistic traits that started in Chopin's music at the time of the concertos, but that became kind of enshrined in his music and were there right up to the end, right up to his very final pieces. He enshrined Constantia herself in the slow movement of the other concerto in F minor, the dramatic recitativo passage that is overtly operatic in the way it sounds, and for which he said that Constantia represented his ideal. The slow movement of our concerto, though, is, I think, even more beautiful. In a letter to his friend Titus, the composer called it romance-like and melancholic, though he then added, it's a kind of meditation on the beautiful springtime, but to moonlight. I think he was rather understating his case. Now Chopin's only works besides those for solo piano, piano and orchestra, and one solitary cello sonata were actually songs. Later, he became friendly with a starry Spanish singer named Pauline Garcia Viado, a young protege of Georges Sand, the novelist, whose name was, real name was Aurora Dudevant, with whom Chopin lived for the better part of a decade. Pauline arranged some of Chopin's pieces as songs, adding her own lyrics. She was the first in a long line of singers and songwriters to do this. Um, they also included Judy Garland and Serge Gainsbourg. Pauline and Chopin would have performed some of these pieces uh, at Georges Sand's salon gatherings in Paris, and also at her country house parties at her uh, lovely tranquil estate in Nohon, which is where they spent their summers. I would have loved to have been a fly on the wall at these gatherings, especially Nohon. It was there that Chopin wrote some of his most beautiful and greatest music. Now the trouble with Chopin's most beautiful and greatest music is that there must have been an awful lot more of it that he simply never wrote down. He was, by all accounts, a simply magical improviser. And this, Chopin's own brand of pianism and his genius for improvisation, is, I think, the ultimate magic ingredient in the formation of his style. Those gatherings at Noan would contain luminaries from the visual arts, from literature, from politics, and more. There'd be Pauline Viardot with her great admirer, the Russian novelist Ivan Turgenev, there might be Chopin's friend, the painter Eugène Delacroix, Georges Sand's friend Louis Blanc, the revolutionary political writer, and of course Sand herself, who I think is much underrated these days. And of course her two children from her former marriage, whose names are Maurice and Solange. Georges Sand wrote an account of one of those evenings when the gathering was listening to Chopin improvising. Here's what she writes. Chopin is at the piano and does not observe that we are listening to him. He improvises as if haphazardly. He stops. Eh bien, eh bien, exclaims Delacroix. Ce n'est pas fini. It's not finished. It hasn't begun, says Chopin. Nothing's coming to me. Nothing but reflections, shadows, reliefs that won't settle. I'm looking for the color, but I can't even find the outline. You won't find one without the other, responds Delacroix, and you're going to find them both. But if I find only the moonlight, 
you'll have found the reflection of a reflection, says Maurice. This idea pleases the divine artist, who resumes playing without seeming to recommence, so vague and hesitant is its musical outline. Little by little, our eyes become filled with those soft colors corresponding to the suave modulations taken in by our auditory senses. And then the note bleu, or the blue note, resonates. And there we are in the azure of the transparent night. Light clouds take on all form of fantasy. They fill the sky. They crowd round the moon, which casts upon them large opal disks, awakening their dormant colors. We dream of a summer night. We await the nightingale. A sublime melody arises. And so that heady cocktail of Polish national music, bel canto opera, classical poise, Baroque counterpoint and harmonic structure, and virtuoso pianism with that amazing skill for improvisation, even all that adds up still only to part of the magic of Chopin. And on that blue note, indeed Chopin may have invented the musical blues, I'll let you go warm up and enjoy the concert. Thank you for coming. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>